groups. Like a, a simple permissions idea, just because permissions and, and groups, is, it seems to be a comp complicated topic for people, and especially because when you, you give someone, you know, site manager, a site manager role, and then they're expected to take care of all that and, and take care of all the permissions for people within their site. It seems like because the permissions part is one of those things where you don't do it often enough that you can that you really remember how it all works. That every time somebody has to do it, they've forgotten, you know, since the last time they did it. So you know, just the things that you do more often is the uploading documents and checking things out and you know, adding list items and, and files. But the permissions thing seems to elude people because of not just maybe the infrequency or maybe it's just the the whole concept of the roles versus the groups is confusing and, and that type of thing. So what I wrote in my blog post was this idea and this is what I do with a lot of with a lot of customers is that uh, when I when I want to say, okay, so you, you know, Joe Smith, you're gonna be the the site manager for this site, you're in charge of it, the the thing that they mostly need to be able to do is just be able to control all the content maybe add some web parts to the home page, and uh, give people access to the site if they need it. So there are a lot of little extra things that you get uh, when you're a site admin with full control or a site collection admin that are really unnecessary in most cases. And I've just seen so many cases where sites get completely hosed up or deleted because site admins who don't know any better will go through and start clicking things in the site settings screen just to kind of see what everything is, just click around, and that's where you start getting in trouble. So just this idea, what I do is I, I create a, um, I, I tell the person they're the site admin and I give them design permission, so I'll give that one person design permission, and that way they can do everything they typically need to do, which is Add, add lists and libraries, add content to those lists and libraries, work on you know web parts all they want to, but nothing having to do with permissions. But then the trick is that you still need to be able to let them give people access to the site. And you know you you do have situations where people want to have more specific permissions for at different lists and, li and libraries, and it starts getting more complicated. Um, but just in general, this example is just say, you know, I have a site for my team or for my project, and somebody needs to have just general access to it, which would be like a, uh, as a member or as just to be able to have read-only access, just one of those basic ways of having access. So um, what I do is I create, when I create, you have that members group that you get when the site is first created, or if it's not there, you can just create it. And then what you do is you, you put that, uh, that site designers group or admins group, the people that you've given design permission on the site, you put that person or group as the owner of the members group. That person's not going to be the owner of their own group, like the whatever you call it, the site admins that have design access. You're not going to, you don't want them to keep adding a whole bunch of other uh, people with design permissions necessarily. But you make them the owner of that members group, and that way when people uh, want to have access to the site, you can, you know, you can use that little, just put a little web part on the home page that shows who the, you know, who they're supposed to ask when they want to have, be able to access the site, you know, if they have read access and they need to have contribute access or that kind of thing. So that way the person is the owner of the group, they can add and remove the members, but they don't have the, that full control permission that lets them create groups and create permissions and, you know, because things that just end up kind of getting out of control sometimes because you have a bunch of individuals added maybe here and then groups added over here and then um, several individuals are added one, on one list and then on another list and it just gets to be a big mess. So it, it's, a, it's a tighter way of controlling it and you give them less freedom, but this is for cases where, you know, you have just basic things that need to be done, just basic collaboration. People need to have just contribute access to the site. And you don't you don't have necessarily highly trained site managers. So you know you could go the whole route where you have governance and you have you know if, you know site manager training to where if you want to have access to have full control to a site, 
you have to go through this certain training. You have to be, you know, have some sort of little certification within your company, um, and have people, you know, have certain rules they have to follow for governance with that. But if you don't have that kind of thing in place, and people are given full control permissions to a site, it, again, it can just become a mess. So, so just as a recap, I call someone the site admin or maybe call the group site admin, but only give it design permission. Give that group or person uh, access as the owner of the group. So in the, in the, like the members group in the group settings, there's an owner box. You can put a person or a group there. You make them the owner. That way they can add or move people from the members group, but they, they don't have full control on the site. And then the next uh, trick is that if someone doesn't have uh, that access to work with permissions, they're not going to be able, when they go to site settings, they're not going to see people in groups at all. They're not going to see any of that stuff. So then you additionally need to go give them access to be able to get to that group to, mo to modify it and to add it with members. So what you do is you have to go to that group um, just in the regular you know, list of groups, and pull up that screen and get that URL, and then take the URL to that group, that actual list of all the members, and put that in the uh, in the navigation and say, you know, to just call it, you know, list of uh, site members. And then if you have uh, the enterprise version of the product, you can even set an audience on that hyperlink so that only those people that have that site or that are site managers can, will see the link. You can do that so other people don't get confused. So other people wouldn't necessarily have access to go to it or to do anything with it, but you can, uh, you can set it up for only an audience if you um, so that's sort of the gist of it. Do you, do you have any questions about it? So managed properties and um, I would say since um working for you in SharePoint, one of um one of my favorite ways of um of actually presenting the information in this for example, something like a search results. Managed properties are pretty much any type of the metadata that's associated with, um, with the list or a column or a content type, type and is being and is being in search. For example, if you create a new content type or site columns or uh, list columns, once the row picks up the control, it will be presented to a scroll property. And you have an option of creating managed properties from that. So what can you do with those managed properties? Managed properties you see a lot on the search center, for example, in the finer panel. So those are the managed properties that expose as refiners. You can also have uh, managed properties exposed in, in your sorting web part, for example, to sort your search results on um, on a title or on a date. So those are the sortable managed properties. You can also expose any type of managed property in an advanced search interface by allowing and users, for example, select a specific managed property like an author of the document or, for example, a description of the document or list item and allow them to search only for keywords in that in the values for that specific managed property. So ma another thing is that managed properties allow you to standardize, for example, specific metadata. For example, if um, I'm indexing file share, right, or in my SharePoint environment, let's say on a file share, the author information is being actually called as owner of the document. And on my SharePoint, there can be author, there can be authors managed, uh, authors metadata where people actually populate the, um, the people names. So well, what I can do, I can just create one managed property and put all the author and owner metadata mapped to this managed property and specify, for example, either take the values from all of them if they're discovered or take a value from a specific managed property in a specific order. So it's a really great way to, um, to unify specific metadata 
and you know, to actually, and they help you to create more interactive uh, search user interface. So, to create managed properties, I do not recommend to create managed properties on any on all your metadata that's available. That might be actually a pretty big waste of resource, but it's definitely helpful. For example, if you have a um, specific group of business users that are using search for their specific need, you can create a custom search center or you know, well, custom. Create a, you can create a search center and expose the metadata properties that are relevant to them in this interface as refiners, as sortable properties. You can also take the managed properties and, for example, um, modify what's being displayed in the teaser for the document that's been returned in the search results. For example, if you want to um, expose the description in the teaser, you, you, you can do that as well. You can just do XSL key, you can expose those managed properties in the user interface, and they really help people to even um, get a glance of what the information architecture is in, in, in the form of refiners. They, they, they can get a good feel of, you know, how many are actually matching a specific refiner. So it's really useful, and, and, and it cuts their discovery time a lot, I would say, but definitely the good way of showing the value is to find a business group that's utilizing search, talk to them, understand what type of information architecture their content is being, um, is using, and go from there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I bet you an awful lot of people don't even know that it exists. Uh, reporting services, that, to, to the extent that every anybody's been exposed to it, is, is pretty familiar with uh, what's called BIDS, uh, Business Intelligence Development Studio, and that's uh, basically it's Visual Studio with projects for analysis services, integration services, and reporting services. And with that, you fire up an instance of Visual Studio, and you build your report, you do your connections, and then you deploy that out to your um, to your destination server. If you're running in SharePoint integrated mode, you can deploy that out to the SharePoint server. That's the way a lot of people work. But since 2005, there's a, um, well, this was started in 2005, although it wasn't very good in 2005. They included a product called Report Builder, and that's designed to work alongside of um, uh, integration mode, although it will work in, in reporting services um, native mode, but it's basically aimed at uh, a power user versus a, uh, uh, an, an analysis or a, a report designer. And it's a, it's a different interface. It doesn't use Visual Studio. It's a click-once click deployment. Um, so if you've got a, a library set up in SharePoint that's got the content types that support reporting services, and I've got blog posts on all this stuff. It's, I'm, all, all I'm writing about lately seems to be reporting services. Um, if you've got those content types uh, enabled, you can go in there and say create a new report. When you do that, it will send the code down and fire up Report Builder, which is an, uh, an office looking, it's got the ribbon, um, sort of a tool that you can basically build your report sa and save it back to that library in SharePoint, and it's just simply going to work. Um, the blog post there in, in, in question is talking about a bug that uh, a lot of people are uh, bumping into lately. When you, when, when you do that click once deployment I'm talking about, say go, Instead of getting Report Builder um, nice and clean, you get an error saying that the .NET Framework 3.5 needs to be installed, which is a bit of shock if you've already got the .NET Framework 3.5. Um, typically, you're going to go and find out why you're getting that error. Oh, did it get uninstalled? Go reinstall .NET Framework 3.5. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Um, the problem here is not with the framework. It is with Internet Explorer. If you're using Internet Explorer 9, to use this, you're going to get that error because Internet Explorer 9 does not do a proper job of sniffing out the .NET Framework 3.5 and it tells reporting services that it's not available and you get the error message. Um, the blog post just explains that if you fire up the developer tools in Internet Explorer, which is F12, um, you can have the option of running it in a compatibility mode. Flip back to Internet Explorer 8 and everything looks like a charm. It really is that simple. It's not a, and it's not a great workaround, but it's the only one I've found so far. 
So that's it in a nutshell. Wow. Um, I have a question because, and you can use the report builder as a content type, so like as like as a template. Does that make sense? What I'm saying, like for the it, way, no, yeah? it, it's it's perfect sense. It, that is actually how it works. Um, there are three content types when you uh, when you deploy reporting services in integrated mode that get added to your SharePoint farm. Uh, the uh, connection, report, uh, report services connection, and we've got a million connections already in SharePoint. Well, this is another one. Uh, it's for reporting services connections. Uh, the report builder model, which is basic, basically an abstraction of a data model. The, the initial intent was to set it up so that designers could build out um, essentially stored queries uh, and, and put things into you know, English language for, for, for the power users so that they didn't have to actually know the SQL tables and all of that. Didn't really get mm -hmm. used and it's going away. So that's there, but it, that's oh. what I'm just explaining because that's what's there. And then finally, there's it's called the report builder. I think it's just called report builder content type. And if you've got that enabled on a document library, you can use report design. So basically, with the report builder content type, it will know to fire up the work with report builder. And there are some you know, built-in things you can do with these content types. For example, with the, with the report builder content type, you create a report. Um, in the, uh, in the, the little drop-down menu you get beside the, uh, the name of the document, you'll be able to do things like connect it to a, a, a uh, data source or set up processing options. With reporting services, you can do things like schedule reports to run so that users don't have to wait for the data to load. They can, they can see a preloaded report. Things of that nature, that's all driven by that content type. Are people <laughs> using the SQL Server Report Builder? Can, can you say yes if, if you're using this? I will bet you anybody on the call is. But I'd, I'd love to see this. <laughs> no one's using it. Uh, oh, okay. I'm, see, I'm seeing check marks. Excellent. 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 <laughs> excellent. It's just, this is my this is my current soapbox. I want people to use it more. I think it's fantastic. And with what's coming in SQL 2012, um, it's it's going to be even more important. If anyone's heard about Power View or what used to be called Project Crescent, it's only going to be available via, it won't be Report Builder, but it's the same mechanism. It will only be available to SharePoint users um, if you're using a, um, what's called a, a BISM, a Business Intelligence Method Model backend, which is essentially the new uh, engine for, for power for it. Actually working on the project right now, so that's why it's at the top of my head. I keep going on about it. But yeah, uh, Report Builder, is, 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 it's a great tool. I, I just don't think it gets enough exposure. Uh, I've got a more recent post um, that talks about the power of actually using these tools together, using reporting services in SharePoint integrated mode, uh, alongside with the uh, with the uh, with the reporting web parts, and using filters, SharePoint filters, to drive report parameters to give uh, a custom user experience. That's just it's one. I think it's one more post more recent than that one on my blog. So, so you're welcome to go check that out too.